1999, Putin is elected. This is the same year uh, that the U.S. terror bombed Belgrade and broke up the previous, um, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, but Putin brought all of that under control, which accounts for his his popularity. Uh, the the he got rid of the oligarchs. You know, the standard of living increased considerably. Um, and he brought order um, <clears throat> and a sense of dignity back to the Russian people. Now, now we also can go back to uh, James Baker's promise to Gorbachev that NATO wouldn't expand eastward. Uh, since that promise, which was broken almost immediately, uh, the U.S. has incorporated I don't know how many countries, nine or something, and continue to expand eastward. They have incorporated former, former Warsaw Pact countries, former Soviet satellite countries, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Romania, Estonia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the Bucharest Declaration not, sort of nominated uh, <clears throat> Georgia and uh, Ukraine as candidate nations for a path to NATO membership. Uh, then we had Saakashvili triggering um, a sort of civil war when he attacked South Ossetia, and Putin acted on that because these are countries that are bordering Russia. I mean, there was only so much that Russia was going to tolerate at that point um, with the eastward expansion. Um, but the U.S. continued with this idea of uh, <clears throat> incorporating Ukraine into NATO, and this was never going to be acceptable to Russia. Now, remember that the coup in 2014 that put this fascist regime in power in Kiev, these are people that um, <clears throat> are the legatees of, of the fascists in Ukraine with the, that took power when Hitler invaded Poland and unleashed one of the worst pogroms in the entire 20th century, 120,000 Poles, Jews, Roma, Russians were uh, butchered, slaughtered by hand, chopped up, mostly women and children, set on fire. Uh, it, the orgy of violence was so extreme that the German Reich actually came in and stopped it. It offended even the German Nazis. The leader of that Ukrainian nationalist fascist um, party was Stefan Bandera. And the regime in Kiev right now has made Bandera a national hero. There's a statue of him now. Uh, and and the, these are the people that the West is aligning with. So, so these are just some of the kind of key dates that, that you're looking at here. Um, uh, the question that looms over all of this is what was Russia supposed to do? It, you know, the, the, the massacre in Odessa, remember, <clears throat> was um, Israel commanded some of the fascist militia in that. The U.S. has uh, been uh, operating bio labs in Ukraine, experimenting on Ukrainian troops. All of this stuff passes without mention in Western media. I mean, there's not a, not a whisper of any of it. And you are seeing one of the most russophobic propaganda campaigns, I think, that, that one can even imagine ever uh, over the last 10 years, but, but probably longer than that, <clears throat> the, the demonizing of Putin, the demonizing of Russia. You see it in Hollywood. You see it in media. You see it with influencers. Sean Penn is in uh, in Ukraine now in the front row of the press briefings. Greta Thunberg issued a tweet standing with the people of Ukraine. Uh, this is these are the faces of Western capital, really, who are siding with what is a, a neo-Nazi party in in uh, Western Ukraine. So, so. The question is, what was Russia supposed to do? They, they simply had their backs to the wall. This is a country that has a long, long history um, with, with Russia. It's been part of Russia. There are ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Half the country speaks Russian. Uh, 
and yet the U.S. is there with troops illegally. Victoria Newland uh, was the chief architect of the coup in 2014 right. that put the fascists in power, gave millions and millions of dollars uh, to these fascists. Um, none of this is legal or ethical or moral, uh, but it is certainly invisible in, in Western media's coverage of this. Let's uh, turn over to uh, Fabrizio Goldani, who's joining us uh, from Como. Sir, were all options in uh, uh, your um, in your views were all options exhausted? Were all avenues treaded to prevent the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? In retrospect, uh, could the U.S. and NATO have acted differently to de-escalate the situation altogether? Russia obviously put forth its requests. Uh, one being Ukraine can't join NATO. The second, which was a promise that was given uh, to the Russians uh, back in the 90s, no more eastward expansion of uh, the uh, uh, military alliance NATO. Uh, give us your thoughts on that. Yeah. But basically, I think that uh, uh, if uh, we go back to the, the coup and over the... Over the 19, 19, uh, um, 14, the, to, um, 2000, 2014, where the uh, Newland uh, basically declared that they have injected in the Ukraine economy five billion dollars to create the color revolution. So uh, at that point, there was already, uh, I think, uh, uh, the situation. Uh, it was uh, ignited uh, in that moment, okay? And uh, there was uh, no action from uh, the 2014 uh, try to de-escalate this, this situation. On the opposite, uh, we have almost a daily uh, shelling uh, in the Donbass and Donetsk region, okay? We basically um, have uh, maybe, let's say, Eight to ten uh, uh, people wounded uh, or, or or died every day for the last uh, eight years. So the time to escalate for me is the time of the Minsk Agreement. The Minsk Agreement, when when it has been reached, the disposition of the Minsk Agreement, it was uh, pretty clear. It was uh, something that should have granted uh, slowly autonomy to these two regions where the Russian people they recognize the Ukraine border between the Donetsk and Russia controlled by Ukraine people. But uh, let's uh, talk it clearly. Uh, Poroshenko and uh, Zebrinsky now they are not they were not interested at all uh, to uh, <laughs> to to follow this uh, Minsk agreement. So the sabotage uh, of the peace, uh, the, the, the possible escalation, the last until now, okay? Uh, if you talk about escalation the last few days, uh, for me personally, it doesn't make sense because the situation reached a level that uh, which kind of escalation you want to have uh, when you have a prime minister that say that he insists recently uh, to go to enter in the NATO, and not only, he mentioned that he would like to uh, give uh, to his uh, army uh, some uh, nuclear weapon. This is a statement that he did. Okay, so I mean, when you have this uh, kind of, you know, it's easy for me to say that before it was a clown. Okay, then it was uh, entering the in the po politics, but you know, it's not. Uh, it's not fair to say this one, but you know, in some way, uh, this is the reality. You know, when you have a person that, uh, in some way, uh, you know, in very light way, say that they could have, they should have, probably, they should have a nuclear weapon. You know, which other, which other, you know, uh, which other possibility you have uh, to deal uh, with this uh, person? No, I don't think there is many. Right. Uh, Mr. Stepling, uh, he here's another question about NATO altogether. Why did NATO continue 
to exist following the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. What is the purpose of NATO today as we speak? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> ostensibly, there is no purpose. I mean, this question uh, is asked frequently, why does NATO exist? Who is NATO protecting from whom exactly? Uh, NATO serves as a proxy for the U.S., and uh, it, it provides cover for um, U.S. imperialist projects, and, and the fact that it has continued to expand um, is sort of testimony to that. No, there's no, there's no justification for it. The Soviet Union dissolved, and, uh, but, but, you know, the, as I say, the U.S., it seems to me that the U.S. understood Russia was going to do this. They can't possibly have believed that Russia wouldn't react at a certain point. Putin told them he would, and Putin tends to do what he says he's going to do. So they knew that. I think that um, what, what they expect and perhaps desired from the beginning was um, an intense and protracted new Cold War. Uh, if, if you look at media, if, if you look at Hollywood movies even, you, you look at the influencers and the celebrities commenting on all of this, there is a sort of nostalgia now for the Cold War. It's seen as kind of hip and, and romantic even or something. Most people have no grasp of the history here. Most people in the West have, you know, don't know who Stefan Bandera is. They don't know what happened in Western Ukraine in 1943, then, nor do they care, really. Um, they look at this as uh, uh, Putin is the new uh, villain du jour. He has been demonized and described as a ruthless dictator and so forth. When you ask people, well, what has he done that's so horrible, uh, people have no answer for you because he hasn't really done anything so horrible. Uh, it is the U.S. that has created this problem. It is the U.S. eastward expansion, uh, breaking all of the promises, the Minsk agreement, everything going back to James Baker's verbal promise to, to Gorbachev. Uh, and, and remember, again, I point out that, that Yeltsin's election was the direct result of U.S. capital and interference. They had a they had a, a group of four guys in country, orchestrating the campaign that would get Yeltsin elected. And as I say, he was unpopular, but Russians feared a civil war and civil unrest. And the spin was Yeltsin would provide some sort of security. Of course, um, his presidency was catastrophic. Just you know, destroyed the country. And Putin got a hold on that, drove out the oligarchs, brought down inflation, reduced crime, et cetera, et cetera. But as some commentators said, if you look at Ukraine today, which is a massive failed state, really, it resembles what Russia would be had Putin not taken power. That's that's what what Russia was, was teetering on on a condition very similar to what we see in Ukraine today. Um, this is a country with great agricultural potential and wealth, mm -hmm. but it has been um, it has been run into the into the ground, and the U.S. bears some, if not a lot, of responsibility for for the destruction of this state. But um, yeah, the, the, there's no reason for NATO. There's no reason for the U.S. to to desire uh, Ukraine being in NATO. And the other thing is that half the NATO countries, certainly Bulgaria and Turkey in particular, do not want Ukraine in NATO. Um, they want nothing to do with this. So it's there's not a like a unanimous uh, you know single voice coming out of NATO. Uh, there's a lot of dissension and a lot of uncertainty, and people distrust the U.S. and, sure. and their intentions here. So, um, but I but I think this was expected, and I think we are going to see a long, protracted, kind of limited proxy uh, conflict uh, for years to come. Fabrizio Goldani, uh, your thoughts on the same issue? Why is NATO still around? NATO is still around. Uh, I agree that uh, from an historical point of view, there is uh, no more justification because uh, once uh, the 
Soviet Union collapse uh, uh, should have been uh, should have been uh, reduced or dismantled. Uh, let's put it in this way. Uh, for me, NATO today have uh, two functions. One that is uh, military. That uh, we have seen recently that the NATO is not expanding only to east. Uh, so uh, let's say closer and closer and closer to the border of uh, Russia. But it, it operate even on other theater that uh, at the beginning it was not supposed uh, to operate. We have seen NATO in Afghanistan. We have seen NATO in other in other place around the world. So as uh, definitely change the the scope uh, as to preserve uh, uh, preserve it itself because a huge monster uh, money machine. We have to think that. Uh, the spending for the uh, defense in Europe uh, is something around uh, two two percent of the GDP, and the many other costs are not included. So actually, it's more than two percent of the GDP. So it's a huge machine that has to justify uh, itself to exist. And uh, I want to add another thing. So that also has a political reason. NATO is the uh, uh, is the organ where the foreign policy of Europe uh, is uh, generated uh, foreign policy is uh, commanded by the United States uh, and through NATO is uh, implemented okay this is the the real function that uh, today the NATO really have is uh, to keep uh, uh, the European, uh, the European, not the European Union, but the European countries under control, because uh, I can say that uh, we are a colony. Can we say that uh, we are not a colony? I think is is impossible. You know, uh, we don't have any 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 sovereignty in terms of a foreign policy at all. So uh, we as a, a military function, NATO as uh, also a political function. John Stepling, the Ukrainian president, uh, he recently said that his country has been left alone. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ukraine was expecting uh, definitely more from the U.S. and from NATO. Kiev had assurances in the past that they would be assisted in a time of need. Why is that not happening right now? Why is the U.S. not willing uh, to go to any lengths to protect uh, its, its allies? Uh, we've seen this before. We see this pattern before, namely in Afghanistan as well. Well, <clears throat> protect them from what exactly? Um, Russia is not going to go in and slaughter the, the, the residents of Western Ukraine. I mean, from Putin's point of view, he called this a denazification mission. And that's as good a description as anything. Um, this is an illegal government in Kiev put in power by the United States and Victoria Newland and John McCain and Joe Biden, all the architects, Hillary Clinton, uh, that, that saw this as a, a, a sort of real politic uh, uh, gesture. They had no illusions about the people they were putting in power. They knew they were Nazis. The Svoboda Party, the Azov Battalion, they were swastikas. There are photographs of John McCain on stage with a swastika behind him. I mean, so, but this, the Western populace is sort of sheltered from, from this reality. Uh, uh, the, the statements coming from, um, from the, the regime in Kiev are, are delusional, um, you know, and, and I don't know what, how else to describe it. Um, the U.S. is not going to, uh, enter into a, 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 a serious military con uh, confrontation with, with Russia. They're just not going to do that. Thankfully, I mean, they're not, it, at least it seems they're not quite that insane. Uh, but but NATO is, to, as your other commentator pointed out, NATO is uh, justification for increased defense spending and these bloated defense budgets. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, private security forces hired by the U.S. government, Blackwater, whatever it's called, output sent into the region. 
uh, there's going to be all manner of that. And as I pointed out before, you know, the U.S. has bio labs in Ukraine. They have been developing uh, gene editing techniques with, with GM insects and so forth. This all flies under the radar. It's all technically illegal, too. But uh, the, the U.S. had no good intentions. The regime in, in Kiev had no good intentions. They have been, they have been killing people throughout um, the last couple of years, uh, kind of indiscriminately, and, and carrying out bombing raids and, and small um, militia operations. Uh, so, so they're not victims here. The, the, the Western media keeps trying to paint Russia as the aggressor. They are not. They are defending rationally their, their sovereignty. I mean, this is um, a country that is the former part of the Soviet Union. It's next door to Russia. They border Russia. Uh, and and there, is no, there was no way that, that I think Putin could allow uh, anything to escalate further than it already had. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I keep asking a, a rhetorical question here. What was Russia supposed to do? Um, this, this, the aggression here lies, um, lies with the U.S. and NATO. It's that simple, really. And one quick question before we uh, wrap up the program, Mr. Uh, Fabrizio Goldani, the uh, uh, U.K. Armed Forces Minister has uh, stated that British and NATO troops must not play an active role in the conflict in Ukraine following Russia's attacks. Uh, has uh, the United States and NATO uh, left uh, Ukraine high and dry right now? I think that uh, basically the, <clears throat> the idea that uh, uh, the NATO troop has not to be, has not to be moved in Ukraine uh, is uh, in all uh, military that uh, or analysts that uh, we have we have seen uh, we have uh, let's say seen interview in the last uh, two days uh, um, none of them basically uh, all of them say that NATO will not be involved on the ground and uh, has not to be involved on the ground this is uh, something that uh, we have seen on even on the mainstream media uh, from uh, some uh, uh, officer, high officer, like general, and this kind of things uh, that uh, retire now and uh, they comment uh, what NATO should do it. So I think that uh, this is probably what will happen. We will see some uh, increasing of a NATO power around around Ukraine. Ukraine, but not definitely entering uh, in uh, in the country. All right, thanks a lot, uh, author and commentator John Stepling, joining us from Dor from uh, Indore, Norway, and writer and political analyst Fabrizio Goldani, joining us from Como, Italy. With that, uh, it brings us to an end here on this edition of our extended coverage of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Of course, we're going to be focusing on that more later on uh, in our uh, spotlight program. Do stay tuned, though. We'll be back on the top of the hour with our news and brief. Bye for now, everybody.